Greetings, and welcome to episode four of what we're calling a six-fold path for expanding Canlit's reach, or, or why diversity shouldn't be a dirty word. Or if you prefer, when the cannon is misfiring, change the cannon. My name is uh, Michael Marola. Before we get started on the meat of the project, some housekeeping chores, as, uh, as they like to say. So first, uh, a land acknowledgement. The city of Hamilton, where we're located, is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron, Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase, 1792 between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. I would also like to acknowledge and offer my gratitude to the Canada Council for the Arts and the CBC for making uh, this series of online readings and discussions possible. So this is a six part series, hence the reference to the six fold path, pre-recorded to be broadcast on a weekly basis. As an aside, one of the six fold paths includes uh, generosity, right conduct, patience, perseverance, concentration, and wisdom. Hopefully we can put into practice a few of these, if not all. Each week I'm joined by a special, special guest writer for, for some wide ranging readings, discussions, and Q and A's. Each episode consists of a reading of a segment from my novella, The Collection Agency Files, interspersed with my guest reading his, her, their flash fiction, poetry, or other piece of writing, and a conversation on whatever comes to mind, from creativity in a time of a pandemic to the future of Can Lit, and everything in between. Hopefully, just as in that traditional six-fold path, uh, some bits of wisdom will emerge intentionally or not. We'll start, as we usually do, with uh, my third-person bio. The author of a clutch of novels, plays, and short story and poetry collections, uh, Michael Morola describes his writing as a mix of magic realism, surrealism, speculative fiction, and metafiction. Publications include uh, three Bersani Prize winners, the novel Berlin, the poetry collection The House on 14th Avenue, and the short story collection Lessons in Relationship Dyads. He's also the author of two novellas, three other novels, two short, other short story collections, and a second poetry collection. The short story, A Theory of Discontinuous Existence, was selected for the Journey Prize anthology, and the Sand Flea was a Pushcart Prize nominee. His latest novella, The Last News Vendor, claimed first place in the Reader's View Awards. A speculative fiction collection, Paradise Island and Other Galaxies, has just been released by Exile uh, Editions. And while a poetry collection at the end of the world is scheduled from Black Moss from spr for spring of 2021. From November 1st, 2019 through January 31st, 2020, Michael served a three month writer in residence gig at the historic Joy Kagawa House in Vancouver. While there, he finished the first draft of a 200,000 word novel, The Second Law of Thermodynamics, which had a gestation period of more than 25 years. When not sweating over his next poem, short story, novella, or novel, uh, Michael serves as editor-in-chief at Guernica Editions, a Canadian literary publishing house. Born in Italy and raised in Montreal, Michael now makes his home in Hamilton. So for, mo for more information, check out the website at uh, michaelmarola.com. So this is episode four. And my guest for, ep for the fourth episode is, is Lisa Dean. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. All right. So before we move on, a few words on Lisa. So Lisa Dean was born in northern British Columbia and raised in the shadow of the Rocky Mountains. She spent a decade in Montreal, where she studied creative writing at Concordia University before moving on, moving to Toronto. She also lived on random farms and beaches before eventually settling in Crestova, British Columbia, where she still lives, hopefully I still too, where she still lives on an acreage with her artist husband, uh, Maddie Cakes, and daughter Scarlett. 
She's a graduate of the University of Guelph's Creative Writing MFA program and teaches English and creative writing at Selkirk Univer uh, College. Sorry. Her writing has been nominated for literary awards such as the Trillium and Relit Awards, the Irving Layton Award, and the Lit Pop Award. She is co-founder of the Black Bear Review, a Kootenai-based literary journal, and was interviews editor for the Humber Literary uh, Review from 2014 to 2016. Her critically acclaimed short story collection, Waiting for the Cyclone, was published by Brind Brindle and Glass in, in 20, 2016. Her poetry chapbook, The Desert of it Itabira, was uh, published by Above Ground Press in January 2020. And her novella in verse, this Manuel Zeno, is, is forthcoming, hopefully soon. She is currently working hard on A Few Red Flags, a novel in, short, in stories about rebel moms set in her home region of the West Kootenai. If you want to learn more about Lisa, check out her website at lisadean.ca. Welcome again, Lisa. Thank uh, you. So in the title of this uh, six-part uh, online series of readings and discussions, the word diversity features. So how do we define diversity? Uh, Dane Swan, editor of Changing the Face of Canadian Literature, in which Lisa, Lisa has a piece and recently launched by Guernica Edition, says in his foreword, this anthology is a, is, does not celebrate multiculturalism. It celebrates diversity. Diversity is a far wider spectrum. Diversity recognizes those both franchised and disenfranchised. Diversity includes those able and differently able. Diversity recognizes the geography of Canada. Despite rumors to the contrary, Canada is not a Toronto monolith. There are fantastic authors and poets in other cities, towns, and provinces. Diversity recognizes that new writing can be written by both the young and the young at heart. Diversity recognizes that an author may identify as male, female, or other. Diversity also acknowledges that not all writers seek the page as their primary medium. So Lisa, you contributed a piece to uh, Changing the Face of Canadian Literature Anthology, uh, When Saturn Returns, right? That was I the, did, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Any reason, any specific reason why you would submit material to an anthology with this, that particular title? Um, well, I'll be honest, Dane actually emailed me and it's so rare that somebody emails me and says, hey, we want you to submit something. <laughs> Usually I feel like I'm always the person chasing things down. And Sending it out into the cyber universe, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so when I saw that message, I just thought, I'm sure he sent it to probably 50, maybe 100 different people, but I took it really personally and I thought, you know, Dane wants me to write something, so I'm going to come up with something. Um, and I, I didn't have anything ready at the time, so I, that was my gift to the anthology. Um, I wrote it specifically wow, to be seen okay. and hopefully accepted for it. Yeah, because I've, I've been really entrenched in a couple of different projects recently, um, and they've been taking up most of my energy and time. So I know that a lot of writers are really dexterous, and you know, they, they submit to literary magazines all the time, and they have short stories on the go, and this thing and that thing. But lately, I see it for the last five years I've been sort of trying to just hone in on larger projects so it was actually really beautiful and freeing for me to have the chance to to create something um, knowing that hopefully I mean it had to be accepted of course so knowing that hopefully there would be um, an audience waiting with open arms for it when it was done so um, the reason I chose that topic was because around the time that I got the email from Dane, I had done a podcast episode with a couple of local folks here in the Kootenays, and it was um, it was actually specifically about the phenomenon Saturn when Saturn returns. And so um, I was talking to these two other folks. One is a non-gender binary person who was actually the first person to have a child born with a U on their birth certificate in Canada. So. Wow. Oh, wow. Yay, Corey. <laughs> um, and the other is my friend Roniel, who um, is just a musician who lives at the Valley and also has connections to Montreal. So we did a podcast for an hour and we were talking about <clears throat> just this idea of how every 30 years Saturn comes through your chart and it can really screw things up for you. And <laughs> it just, I mean, 
everything changed for me in that year that I was 30. I mean, spanning from just leaving a relationship that I was in that was super unhealthy to my mother was in her own Saturn return that same year. Um, she had me when she was 30. So when she was 60 and I was 30, my life started to have this real defined upswing and she died oh. just three weeks after yeah. she turned 60. I'm and so... <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And so I really wanted to just look at, at how that can work. Like, um, and later on, I'm going to be reading some poems that I've been writing just throughout this period of the pandemic, but just thinking about, um, you know, the forces that shape us that are chosen and the ones that are external and sort of just sort of parsing through that process of what we, what we bring into our lives and what comes without our permission and how we navigate through those landscapes. Right. Right. Well, do you, do you have any like opinions on how, how do you feel about the state of Canadian literature at this at this at the moment at this time? Is it good, bad? Are we moving in the right direction? Well, I mean, it's it's sort of it's tricky to ask. Like, I'm I'm a white person, you know, and I'm I've, I've definitely been at different positions in my life where I've you know had issues that were significant barriers to my life and my writing practice but i'm at a stage right now where like i have, I have an autoimmune disease that's stable right now so i don't have that factor um i've had addiction issues which you know are stable right now so i don't have that factor moving against me so you know i'm sitting here as a currently able-bodied um currently not disabled person with a, a job which a lot of people don't have after the pandemic so i'm not sure how valid my opinions are on the state of Canlet, but I can certainly tell you that I do a lot of listening these days. And, um, you know, I don't love Twitter because I find it really overwhelming. There's, it's just like walking into the choir of the world's loudest and, and most bright voices. And it can be super overwhelming just to hear all those voices all at once, because it's, as I'm sure, you know, just tweets come through every second and, yeah. and, but I, I listen to a lot of the women in Canlet right now. I'm really interested in what, especially BIPOC individuals. I mean, I think that Alicia Elliott is a hero to most people in this country. Um, and her voice is essential. There are others as well. I think like JL Richardson as well. Just, I always follow what she's doing because she sort of brings out an umbrella of everyone who's involved in the festival of literary diversity. And so it sort of feels like a one-stop shop into a lot of different windows of important voices just by, you know, visiting those two places. But, but you know, that's not all. I mean, I pay attention to what other people are doing as well. And and I think there has been a really significant dismantling over the last few years. I mean, even just thinking about the book Refuse, um, Canlet in Ruins, and having that come out by Book Hug Press, um, and the reception on that and how it's being taught in classrooms. I, I do, I think that there's a lot of work that's being done on the topic of of this program, right? That idea of diversity and if the canon's misfiring, then change the canon. So there's a lot of change happening, and I think that's really exciting. And I don't know that I get to be a part of creating that change other than being a voice that listens. And that's an important role too. I think that writers who are in the more privileged positions, especially I'm an educator. I teach creative writing here at Selkirk College in the Kootenays. Um, and I'm in the unique position to be able to bring in voices that are traditionally outside the canon into the classroom. So my syllabus is, I'd say maybe 70 to 80% female. Um, there's a huge chunk of those readings that are not like dead white people from like Russia or America, for example. I teach a lot of Canadian content and, and I think it's great that, you know, I have that power and possibility, but a lot of people don't have that, so. Right, well, but I mean, you know, the the idea of, of diversity does include, it should include everyone. And mm -hmm. there shouldn't be exclusions, you know, of, of any type. And, and, and sometimes there's, there's that, you know, sometimes there's, there's the feeling that, okay, you're being excluded because you're not considered diverse enough, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but as you say, you, you, you're in a position where you can actually influence certain things and, and get the voices out there. And that, to me, is part of the whole process. You know, as, uh, at, uh, here at, uh, at I'm, I'm, I'm also, I'm, I mean, I'm, I consider, you know, Italian Canadian. Okay, so Italian Canadian at one point was considered outside the canon. In fact, it probably still, still is. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, at, at Guernica, what we try to do is to, is to, is to 
bring in as many voices as we can. And, and so if someone says, well, you're not that, you're not part of that. Well, you know, uh, well, we are in a sense because we are trying to sh get those voices out there as you, as, as you say yourself. So, you know, that's all part of it as well, I think. And that's all part of the way the, the, the canon is changing, uh, hopefully, hopefully. I mean, there's a, you know, I, I think in Canada, it's, it's much quieter, but there is a culture war going on here as well. You know, it's, it's not out there on the streets with, the, with machine guns and all that sort of thing. But there is one going on. At, you know, yeah, and I, I don't even know how quiet I would consider that to be. I mean, I think that it is sort of spatially quiet if you think about physical presence. But if we think about the internet as a legitimate space, in which I think it's becoming more and more, um, more and more important than physical space, just because like with the pandemic, we can't even group together anyways. And so to see that cultural war and the cultural change unfolding um, on the internet is, is really exciting. I think it's, it's great. And for so many of us to have the possibility of witnessing that from, from where we are, and what I mean geographically where we are and where we are spiritually, where we are um, just philosophically as well. It's just, it's so, co it's so cool. Okay, all right. So uh, how about, uh, you, you can start off, how about uh, reading uh, your first piece would be the introduction to your, to your chapbook, uh, How to Survive, and, and the first two poems from, from, from the book, from the chapbook. I'll, I can talk a little bit about the chat book. So, like I said, I've, I've been really entrenched in really focused projects, but out of the blue, I had, you mentioned actually in my bio that I'm, I'm married to an artist and uh, he was participating in an art slam to raise money for our local harm reduction folks here. It's an organization called Anchors. And it was the day that the art slam was starting and he just looked at me and he said, Lisa, why aren't you doing something for the art slam? And I thought, well, it's for artists, you know, like visual artists. And he said, no, no, there's a guy who's doing like a cooking challenge. There's all these different people that are, that have come together to just to figure out how they can fit into this banner of artists. And so I contacted them and, you know, see if I could sneak in right under the radar and participate. And, and so, and so I did, um, I'm just going to grab my, <clears throat> my physical copy of my chat book here. Um, this is what the actual chat book ended up looking like. Hey. Sort of put it together, put some art in it and things. Um, in 72 hours, I'll mention as well, I have a two year old, so, and, and I have a fairly full time job. So, and my husband and I, we both work here at the college. So, um, the day the slam started was the first day of school. Oh, no. <laughs> and it lasted for the first three days of school. So, we're navigating like massive upheaval, people who have never used Zoom before trying to figure out how to get to their virtual classroom. And in the background, I'm scribbling down these poems furiously in hopes that I can actually come up with anything decent in 72 hours. Um, so we were given a prompt and the prompt was a quote from a movie called How to Survive a Plague. Um, and the quote was this, it was, someday there will be a people alive on this earth who will hear the story that once there was a terrible disease, and that a brave group of people stood up and fought, and in some cases died so that others might live and be free. So I get that in my email box and I'm like, oh God, how am I supposed to come up with something on such a profound topic in 72 hours? I mean, I'm a really slow writer. It takes me years to come up with things that I feel happy about. So I had to really just get over myself <laughs> for those 72 hours and just realize that this isn't about me. It was to raise money for an organization and at the end of that, I realized that I actually learned something really important through the process. And number one um, is that when we're given prompts like that, and if we have time to just sort of mull them over, we can just sort of situate ourselves in our current here and now in a way that we might not have otherwise. So for me, listening to that, um, that quote, and it comes from a movie about just the AIDS pandemic. And so I started watching the movie and I thought, I'm not gonna write a chapbook about AIDS. That's appropriation of voice. I don't have AIDS. Um, no one in my family has AIDS. I, I, I know two people who um, are HIV positive and they're you know, super inspirational people, but it's not a big part of my life. So I thought, what else could I do with this particular prompt? And so I was really, and you'll see this with my second reading as well, I'm really interested in this idea of survival and change and what that looks like right now. So people might, you know, actually survive something significant, like, you know, um, 
I do have friends who are refugees and their families have been killed before their very eyes. Right. You know, that's significant. I've never experienced that. I can't write about it, but I can certainly meditate on the other ways that people survive. So I ended up in a surprising way meditating sort of on some of my own experiences of what felt like survival for me at certain points in time. Um, just growing up in a, in a fairly rough interior town, um, you know, lots of substance abuse issues in our family. And then I had my own throughout different periods in my life. And, and so I wanted to just sort of work with that, those different registers of trauma. So there were poems in the chat book that were found poems. So I found narratives of people living with AIDS and sort of rearranged some of those to address those topics. So like I have a poem called How to Survive the First 24 Hours After Learning You're HIV Positive. And so the way that I felt comfortable delving into that territory was by using the voice of someone who's from within that community. But what I ended up doing with my own is I just um, ended up thinking about self-isolation and all the loneliness and the stir craziness and the major shifts that certain people went through when the pan pandemic first happened. So I have a series of poems called How to Survive Self-Isolation. And then I just thought about what it meant to survive my own youth and to survive my own terrible habits as a human and just the way I sabotaged it myself at points in my life. So they're not necessarily autobiographical poems. I mean, some of the stuff just came out of the air. I don't, I don't really know whose experiences or whose voice this is, but I felt comfortable channeling it. So without further ado, um, I can read the first two poems from that chat book. So right. the first one is called How to Survive Self-Isolation. Listen. Just listen. Hear the geometrics of forgotten feelings now arranging themselves in patterns intricate as bottle of lightning. And the second one's called How to Survive an Ice Cream Headache. Think about really hot things like a stick wrapped in a melting plastic plate that you used to burn ants while you were camping. The ant bomber, you called it, laughing your ass off as their legs burst into flame. Because it was the 80s. No one was recycling. No one was talking about Buddhism, at least not in Cranbrook. And your parents were too busy drinking to teach you a lesson. These memories always seem to surface in recovery meetings, just a deluge of all the stupid shit you wish you hadn't done like an ice cream headache, that flash of unbearable pain before that slow euphoria of gratitude you can only experience in juxtaposition. Wow, that's, that's that, you wrote those within, in, in 72 hours? Is that the, yeah. the whole thing? I came up with 17 pages of poetry. I just, <laughs> I think the person who was most surprised about that was myself. I didn't think I had it in me, but. Well, you got some beautiful lines in there, I'll tell you right now. and and. The uh, I, I like the uh, geometrics. Uh, the geometrics of forgotten feelings is also it's beautiful. And in the second poem, the way you you sort of built up the, the, the title is kind of a a laugh title. And and then and then you get into the poem itself. And then and it's all about you know uh, the cruelty of of of, uh, of 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 you know just youth. Sometimes you can call it that. It's a you know we've all done it. We've all tortured animal, tortured small creatures, you know, especially the ones that we, like Shakespeare, we, 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 we kind of, you know, we're, we're, we're boys, we're boys, just, just uh, as if, as if that's the, the entire universe, you know, yeah. but that beautiful, beautiful. Uh, so this is, it was a chapbook. So it, it, it's, is it going to be published or is, or is it not? Uh, you know, this started last Tuesday, and I don't know. I mean, it. I I did a limited print run, so this was to raise money for anchors um, for folks living with HIV AIDS in the region. So, I made I made ten copies and put them up for auction. So there's ten copies in the world. I'm interested in this idea though, and the things that came out, and I might end up trying to develop it into something larger. I feel is though I just got started in those three days. And these are, you know, very lightly edited, obviously. I want to go back and <laughs> really make them shine. But I think there might be something there, especially in this moment in time, this idea of the survival guide. And I had this much larger idea of going into, like, different types of, like, for example, the title for this one, How to Survive an Ice Cream Headache, I just 
Googled how to survive handbooks. And I came up with all these resources. And one of them was just this weird, um, it was just this weird list of like 20 super quirky run of the mill things that happen to people. And one of them was the ice cream headache. And so I thought I could go back in there and pick out some of these other ones and just like graft it onto personal experience and make it something different. So I think there's a project here, Michael. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. So the next part, the next uh, section is, is where I'm reading from uh, my novella, the next portion of my novella, uh, the collection agency's uh, uh, files. And to bring you up to speed, the collection agency files is a full translation from the German consisting of five sections and a fragment of a sixth related, relating to events that take place during and immediately after the Second World War, uh, blending historical facts and alternative history uh, themes. It chronic chronicles the creation and subsequent actions of a, a, quote, collection agency in Germany and the adventures of one of the agents uh, called uh, Claudius in, in the midst of the rapid rise and even more rapid collapse of the thousand year, right? So the introduction is, uh, following the collapse of the Natsock Workers Bank of Chicago, Inc. in January of 20, 2008, an obvious victim of the subprime mortgage tobacco, in combination with the usual derivatives and hedge fund mismanagement, and the subsequent seizure of whatever corporation assets were still in existence, the following items that have come to be known as the collection agency files, originally, originally in German, uh, die Daten von der Sumlang Agentur, were recovered. And the materials discovered among other documents and papers and safety deposit boxes within the bank's main vault were originally in German, and have been subsequently translated into English by the writer who accepts all responsibility for any errors of omission and commission within said translation. So this is item three of, of, the, of the six. Uh, the real pol political reform, an example, part one. Date released July 21st, 1944. Author unknown, circulation, ministerial, governmental, collection agency, executive committee, Type, event summary. Thanks to an anonymous tip from a woman who claimed she wished nothing to save to serve her country, a courier has been intercepted with startling consequences for all involved. At first it was believed he acted simply as a minor spy in those largely ineffectual networks that spring up like weeds during the war. They uncover, the, the, the uncover material of the greatest importance right after a news conference has been called to announce it, or they walk straight into the traps set by our ever alert interior ministry agencies, thus providing information to the enemy that is false, if not detrimental to their war effort. However, no one could have suspected when they shot the courier trying to flee through the Ardennes forest, the significance of the letters he was carrying nor could the lieutenant in charge be blamed if he couldn't read what was in those letters. Naturally, assuming the papers were in code, he did the right thing and handed them over to the district SS man. He, in turn, had them sent under armed guard to the main decodification center back in Berlin. But no matter how, how much the words were tortured and distorted, converted to numbers, added and subtracted, or run through mechanical decoding systems, they stubbornly refused to yield up their secrets. That they were decoded at all could be considered an absolute stroke of luck if it hadn't turned out that the collection agency was involved. What happened was that one of the menials, a swarthy fellow whose job it was to pick up and incinerate waste paper at the center, glanced at a pile of sheets on a desk and read, plans for a shadow government. That he could do so, could he, that he could do so, could do this while dozens of others had failed as easily explained. He had been a scholar of ancient Greek languages previous to the war, and not just any ancient Greek languages, but those of what are called, what is called linear, linear B, spoken in the late Bronze Age. When the demand for these types of Greek scholars quickly waned, he put himself on a list of those available for government service. The collection agency recruited him, bonded him for security reasons, and then in order to have their own man at the decoding center, found them a job. Naturally, as soon as the top echelon officers were told of his serendipitous discovery, the man was ordered jailed, for his own good, of course. But when the military police came for him, 
he had mysteriously vanished. Or rather, the collection agency had relocated him within the filing cabinet bowels of their headquarters, as close to sanctuary as could be found and much safer than any church. The arresting officers were informed of this after the fact and assured that he'd been sworn to secrecy so that no word of the plans would ever leak out. Language experts with the highest security clearance were then called in to finish the translating task. Here are the results. These are the letters. Greetings, Kleistenes. If the time was ripe yesterday, it is overripe today. You have indicated the people are with you all the way. Beware of them. It's, it's not seemly to have the mob at your back. When they strike, they can't differentiate friend from foe. Of course, the desire of every popular leader is to mold the rabble, the rubble, to his image and likeness. You have done that admirably. So admirably, perhaps, as some of the more intelligent are now asking themselves what it is that distinguishes you from them. Oh yes, even here along the sea and so far away, we hear of the turmoil and upheaval brought about by your agitation. Is it true that there are, there are now roving gangs of perfectly respectable middle-class burghers who become political monsters at night, attacking the secret police and collection agents and tattooing their foreheads? Much of the glamour would be lost if it became widely known that these are spontaneous outbursts. Take the blame for them, at least in the eyes of the underlings. The small risk you run will be more than compensated for when our larger plan is unveiled. My transfer here has done little to aid my, my marriage. We are still as far apart as ever. I am attracted by the bright lights of the nearby town and the music that floats to us. The women there are all smiles and seem hungry for men, chocolates, and cigarettes. Most of their husbands and lovers are either dead or in the underground with little chance of surviving the war. She, on the other hand, passes the time collecting shells and playing with Rollo. He, like me, is becoming more frisky with age and has turned into the most fantastic spe specimen of a purebred German shepherd. If only people could be bred with the same purity and taste for obedience. As for my wife, I don't know what to make of her. Two days ago, she cut herself on the wrist with one of her confounded shells, not too deeply, but just enough to bleed profusely and put a scare into all of us. Fortunately, one of the soldiers from the wall spotted her and was able to rush her for medical treatment. I owe him my, her life. She is resting at this moment. I have so far refrained from asking how it happened for fear she might tell the truth. She is a sensitive creature, as you well know, and not made for these robust and goose-stepping times. Her mind is constantly on romantic poetry and good to. As well, I think she is carrying on an affair, perhaps platonic, perhaps not, and with whom I have not been able to discover. But she sometimes comes home at night smelling of another man. It doesn't matter to me, as I have other concerns, but there are dark moments when I tire of her affectations, her long, lonely walks on the beach, her sighs and moans, mo moments when I wish to break her in two, but then I'm afraid two of her would grow back to haunt me forever. Nevertheless, we are both looking forward to seeing you here with us. Perhaps your boundless humor will serve to revitalize her, at least restore her complexion. Have you ever noticed how romantic poetry blanches a person and drains them of blood? I myself am more healthy and active in, in all ways than ever. My strict diet and strenuous daily exercise have served me well. It will be no match for me in tennis and swimming. Uh, so remember that mind and body must work as one. Our nation must be trimmed of its fat and, and excess baggage, the creamy madness rising to the surface to be skimmed away. What better people to do it, eh, old friend? In keeping the oath, like Urges. The next letter. My dearest Solon, the choice of our Pericles is no longer in doubt. As much as I admire your legal experience and knowledge of jurisprudence, I don't believe, and here you must concur, the people will accept you as their leader. The nature of your work has kept you entirely out of the spotlight. As well, you are too honest and not a good enough actor for the part. There is only one man who qualifies. His past is spotless. No atrocities or unnecessary butchering stain his record. Although he is aristocratic by nature and family, the role of popular hero fits him well. I, among many, am convinced he is exactly the man needed to pull the disparate threads together and to prepare our nation for an honorable peace 
or as honorable as it will, uh, will allow to, will be possible to negotiate. As well, he has acquitted himself admirably through long and difficult military campaigns. Even today, with our backs literally to the wall, it is important to keep our mar martial prowess at its peak and not become another nation of so shopkeepers, though con confidentially that nation has done it well for itself. Only tactical errors and failures in logistical planning have prevented us from further conquest. And further conquests are now out of the question, at least for the foreseeable future. However, if we are to maintain what we have earned, this insanity, this dark tumor, must be expunged from our midst. For a nation with our history, our culture, our refinement, the status of being a pariah is out of the question. We must, at all costs and for the sake of civilization, reestablish our supremacy, <coughs> our legitimacy within the brotherhood of nations. Needless to say, you will play an integral part in all this. The shape and scope of our future laws have been left to you. Nothing is more important than a system of checks and balances. The time will come, much as we dread it and find it difficult to stomach, when the reins of government will fall once more into civilian hands. Your laws and the nation's willingness to obey must of necessity cement that process. No figurehead role for you, absolutely not. You will be remembered as the father of a new spirit in this great nation. In this moment of impenetrable gloom, I can see our philosophers, our politicians, our poets, our musicians, and our military leaders amassing behind us. I beg you not to overly concern yourself with the lawlessness currently holding sway in our, in our cities. We are merely fighting fire with fire. Let me remind you of our schoolboy days before you left the academy. You once complained, do you remember? that no one fought fairly any longer, but you were determined to do so. Until the day one of the nouveau-rich bullies kneed you in the groin and left you gasping for air. There's no need for me to go any further. My wife sends her utmost regards and an inquiry as to whether you might not obtain the latest edition of Schiller's Complete for her. At the same time, I eagerly await the first draft of your laws. Yours in trust, Lycurgus. Next letter. My glorious Pericles, there is still time for you to reconsider your position. That you did not give your assent on the spot can only be attributed to a lack of information, a lack for which we can take, must take the blame. But no longer is it possible for you to plead ignorance of the situation or claim that your distance from the maelstrom lends enchantment to the, to the overview. While in the midst of battle, with the sand in your mouth and enemy fire on the horizon, such beliefs are understandable. After all, there are more important matters to occupy one at those times. I know having myself fought in a cleaner war, a cousinly spat, when the honor of the nation was indeed at stake, but now we have presented you with considerable proof of what the present regime has done to degrade our race in the eyes of the world. A war, or as you well re realize, is no time to discard all concepts of fair play and decency. History is especially harsh when it comes to treating these matters. If we are to kill men and defeat nations, let it be done with pride and dignity. Butchers are nothing but specialized shopkeepers and no better than house painters who don't realize their place in the scheme of things. The government in power has descended to such depths that not even high ranking army officers are immune from insult and embarrassment. Only last week, a retired general and personal acquaintance of mine was shoved by the mob on the street. Then when he took out his ceremonial sidearm and started to shoot, over their miserable heads, mind you, he was arrested. The main culprits in all this are the collection agents. They have had the nerve to hound my wife for over a year, demanding payment for certain silk undergarments she had bought on a whim and then no longer desired. No one seems to have the authority to liquidate them once and for all, wiping their bland smiles and hangdog looks from the face of the earth. In fact, reliable sources have informed me they are on the verge of receiving tremendous new powers powers of search and interrogation, powers to carry weapons, etc. Are we to believe they are simply agents collecting debts? Ridiculous. A more reasonable assumption might be that the government is using them to gather information, to spy, and eventually to take over the duties of the secret police. The combination of bookkeepers and torturers. These agents must be stopped before the new powers are granted them, and they become untouchable. Intimidation and scattered assassinations, as in the past, are not enough. That would only serve to make them popular. Besides, the agents themselves are concerned solely with their duty 
excellent soldiers, in other words, who can easily be retrained. As well, we have already attempted to destroy the agency itself without much success. It is too well protected, kept out of the line of fire by someone very high up in the hierarchy. We must have the people behind us, and you are the man for this, without a doubt. Already, and this is in the strictest confidence, we have turned down Cleisthenes, too much of a rabble rouser and lacking the support of the army, and Solon, too intellectual, too technical, unable, and unable to deal effectively with common sense matters. They will make unparalleled lieutenants in any case. I offer my humble services as well, along with the modest resources at my disposal. Nothing will be required of you in the initial stages except your approval of the plan. You are absolved of all bloodshed or involvement in any needed terminations. The people must come to recognize you simply as the soldier who did his best, with honesty and courage, against insurmountable odds. Your natural modesty and an infinite good breeding will take care of the rest. Of that, you can be assured. The taking over the of the government by you will guarantee democratic elections the moment the war comes to an end. How can we possibly deny the people their rights? Most have served the nation well, giving their lives without question for what they believe to be the greater good. Is it their fault that this has proven un untrue, has resulted in a series of lies and atrocities leading nowhere? They have only rumor and hearsay to guide them. Most do not possess the necessary schooling and intelligence to understand the reasons behind the war, the vast movements of history, and the inevitable clash of ideas. Are we to blame a hungry, desperate, angry populace for clinging to the filthy skirts of the only man who seemed able to feed them, clothe them, give them dignity? Even I feel a twinge of remorse at having to put this prosperity at risk, but I am willing to live with it. Remorse might well be the greatest and most practical of all attitudes in the eyes of God. My wife is always saying how terribly sorry she is, how terribly sorry for being terribly sorry. Even a confirmed atheist finds delight in conquering remorse when committed to the lesser of two evils. You personally need not concern yourself with this. Simply be prepared to take the reins of the riderless caravan. That alone is enough to win you eternal fame or eternal satisfaction if fame is found too fleeting. I remain confidentially yours, Lycurgus. All right, we'll take a break. These are the three letters written by three about to try to take over, try to take down Adolf Hitler and the boys. So this is the second, uh, second uh, reading break. And uh, <coughs> you say in, in one, of the, one of your statements, or you're, maybe you're joking, you say, when you're a writer, there's no such thing as life outside, outside of work. Even when you're at rest, your head is still inside whatever book you're writing. And also on, on your website, you, you quote uh, Anais Nin, that's, uh, if you're a writer, you have to write just as you have to breathe. Are these, I'm, I'm, I have the same feelings, and because people always ask me, what would you do if you weren't a writer, right? And I can never answer that question. So I, I'm just curious about what your feelings are on, on, on you know, what it is to be a writer and, and you know, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of exposure to writers just by, I mean, obviously being a writer, but being a teacher helps me understand that as well. Um, I teach first and second year creative writing at the college, and, and so often I just see and hear resonances from the classroom of that same kind. People are like, I don't, I don't really know why I'm here, but I just can't stop writing, is what they say. And I'm like, that's how it is, right? It's just this, this strange, large club of people who... If you're outside of it, I mean, my husband's great. He really is. But I can tell that sometimes he's just like, are you listening to me? I don't, I'm not sure that you're listening. Like, are you, are you writing a book in your head again? And I just, most of the time I'm guilty. That's what I'm doing. I'm writing a book in my head. Um, so there is this sort of dexterity. You need to be able to live in your sort of day job, day to day life and then be a writer at the same time. So it's almost like this weird dissociative state where you are, you're sort of in two places at once most of the time. And, and you know, Michael, I can't imagine my life being any other, any other way. I, you know, I, I don't know that I could change this if I wanted to. I don't know that I could just quit writing. I mean, I just don't, I just don't know what that would look like or how it would feel. I, f I think I would feel lost as a human. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, that's, that's the thing. I mean, and, and 
the way I, I look at it, it's not even you. I don't think you'd feel lost. Uh, you wouldn't have any real concept of, 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 of your identity at that point. Uh, I, at least that's the way I look at it. Um, on, on, a, on a less philosophical level, what, what, what are your earliest memories uh, as a writer? What, what do, you, do you remember when you first started? Oh, okay, this is what I want to do. I remember exactly when it was. And I should have known, I should have known right at that moment because I, I sort of left writing, um, I left the writing life for a while. I, I graduated high school and I had, you know, a lot of other people giving me ideas about what I should do with my future. And I, so I followed those other people's ideas. And, and it wasn't until I was 27, I took my very first creative writing class. You know, that was like eight years after starting my post-secondary education. And it was a class at Concordia. And I remember walking into that classroom and being like, oh, I actually cried. I cried after that class because I just, I felt like I was at home for the first time. And I just, I lamented all those lost years where I wasn't engaged in the writing life or a writing practice and wasn't even trying to pursue that because I just had this idea that it wasn't possible for most people um, and didn't realize that that shouldn't have mattered. I should have just done it anyways and followed my heart. But when I think back to the very first time when I just, I was, I was in it, um, I think I was, my parents say that I was either eight or nine. We don't remember exactly. Um, but I started writing a series called Allie the Alien. <laughs> and so I, and I did it all. I, I like binded my own books and like glued it all together. I did all the little art aliens, the little stick people. And the thing that really should have tipped me off is that I drew a picture of myself and made a little author's bio in the back. I was like, Lisa Dean is nine years old and she's the author of the Alley, the Alien series. Like that was it. But, yeah. but I had that, that reflex to draw a picture of myself and give myself a bio at the age of eight or nine. I mean, I should have known. I should have known. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. That's my earliest memory. And, and now what, what, what do you think, what compels you to draw, to, to write? I mean, you've explained a bit of that already, you know. But, uh, I think it's just, I think it relates back to that first experience of being in a creative writing classroom and feeling at home. Um, I've had so many instances in my life where I just haven't felt at home in the world or with myself. And so if there's one space where I can create that connection with myself and with the world, I feel so connected when I'm in my writing practice. Um, and I, I think especially in these times where everything's just so up in the air and it's, people are just, their identities are shifting and floating and, you know, it's just everything's spiraling. And if I can have that one thing to anchor me, I'm going to hold on to it for dear life. Right, right. But um, when you're writing, do you, do you see the writing as uh, something that's internally driven or is, some, or is it through societal pushes or struggles of some kind or both or neither? So, um, yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I think... I think it happens in two ways for me. Um, part of my writing practice just comes out of the ether, like this chat book. I mean, you know, I had to sign up for the art slam for it to happen, but just by walking through that door, all of a sudden it just like all these poems just seemed to come out of the ether. I wasn't thinking in advance about any sort of collection that might look like this. And then other times I'm really writing to respond to a specific problem that I see. So in my first book, Waiting for the Cyclone, I was really, just sort of tired of certain types of women in literature. And, you know, I, I had been reading lots of books like by Nancy Lee, Dead Girls, for example, Mary Gates Gill's work with these misfit women. And I just thought, I wanna be part of that. I wanna write some misfits and I wanna normalize this misfit way of being because I think it is more common than people imagine. And there's nothing wrong with being a misfit. So um, it is that sort of, I mean, there's the whole Gandhi quote that everyone seems to have as their tagline at the end of their email where it says, be the change you wish to see in the world. And, it's, and, and maybe that's part of it. Like maybe I see how I can, I can fit into that, right? Like it's little building blocks that make change. So if every woman out there who's a misfit and who wants to write about misfits and who wants to be a misfit all joined forces and wrote books that people loved or at least liked or at least bothered to read, <laughs> then all of that gains momentum and it becomes something. So, so that was sort of what I was doing with my first book. And now, I mean, I became a mother two years ago and just looking at the way that people are mothers in the world and some of the weird subliminal gaslighting that happens and the judgment that you get, 
all those little things I've just been keeping stock of over the last few years. And, and I want to explore that. So the novel I'm writing now takes place here where I live. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just sort of, I'm taking all those, those thoughts and, and just problems that I've been reckoning with and just building them, building them into fictional characters so that we can explore, you know, that, that sort of dirty underbelly of parenting. Um, maybe it's not particularly original, but, um, but it's important. It's important subject, I think. So yeah, yeah, and and, and a lot depends on the voice, and, yeah. and the and the and the slant and the angle that that the whole thing comes in at, right? Exactly. So, yeah, you know. And, uh, yeah, great. So okay, so this is where you get to read uh, the second part of your How to Survive poems, the uh, How to Survive Internet Dating, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and How to Survive Self Isolation too. And how to survive self self isolation three? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, how to survive internet dating? Your friends kept saying, "You don't have to do this," but you called it research for your next book, or maybe you admitted you were bored. Okay, lonely. Okay, blown wide open by your ex and his ex and his new girlfriend. You were the Bill Murray of dating, meeting over and over at three speed beside another couple meeting at three speed beside someone wearing the same shirt as your date. 10 years later, what you remember of that year is a smear. There was a polyamorous aerial gymnast, a DJ, a life coach, at least 20 unemployed artists. You do remember this one date with a pathological liar twice your age. His profile said 30, but he kept talking about the 70s. <laughs> he told you many preposterous things, but the one you remember best was his claim that grandma was the sun made girl. You knew he was probably lying, but it's rude to fact check on a first date. So you let yourself believe just for an hour that his grandmother was that famous Fresno Bell of the Raisin Empire black cascades of curls flowing into a lush basket of luminous grapes soon to be transformed into wrinkled, lifeless <laughs> fruit. Looking back, what pleases you most was his correct assumption that you'd be dazzled by such an odd lie. Of everyone you dated that year, perhaps he was the only one who really <laughs> understood you. <laughs> Glad you're chuckling. <laughs> Um, how to survive self-isolation number two. Sewing quietly by the window, you notice a splash of blue sky over the dead willow tree, just drenched in symbolism, but it's the kind you need to survive right now. The needle folds into a torn dress for which no occasion exists to conjure it from the dry cleaner's plastic, unless you RSVP to this week's bizarre occurrence in a world you thought could no longer surprise you. Your second cousin is getting married over Zoom. At the church on the old highway, the purple stained glass Jesus watching over the Arby's drive through In the 90s, at a family reunion, the cousin's stepfather hoisted you over the fence, thick hands cupping your ass before you dropped into the parish next door, where the garden exploded with carrots and beets. You returned with fistfuls of dirty phallic roots that you rinsed downstairs in the same bathroom, where he later blew marijuana smoke into your eager mouth. You enjoyed every minute of it back when you weren't old enough to understand shame. How to survive self-isolation number three. Wind tunnels through the garden, lifting corners of black tarp, singing its barren song of never-ending winter. The rattle of deer fencing reminds you of what grows there, what would never seed, and what still lies fallow beneath the snow. Fantastic. That's great. Beautiful. Your, your self-isolation poems are, uh, they're kind of uh, shivery, kind of shivery things. They get, uh, I get uh, little goosebumps, you know, just uh, some of the lines in them. Fantastic. 
I think I'm channeling the spirit of March, <laughs> which is when <laughs> I was I was bringing my mind back to March when the self isolation first happened and trying to channel sort of that desolate sort of feeling of That's cold really and uncertainty. Um, yeah, yeah that dark emptiness that was sitting inside of most of us. <laughs> yeah, we're we're uh, in fact we're about to put, well it'll be coming out in the spring of 2021, but we're doing uh, a, a book on uh, uh, author. Uh, uh, Quebec Writers Federation authors who wrote each one wrote one day they wrote uh, their their take on on on, on isolation and, and uh, back in April. Oh and wow! A lot of the a lot of the uh, a lot of that is a similar. Uh, you know, there's an there's an attempt to 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 try to be more ebullient, more you know, but there's always right in the back. There's always that feeling that. Well, I don't know. This this might be the end of it all, or something, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say that right now, um, the air quality. Well, yesterday, our air quality in Castlegar was the yeah. worst in Canada. So yeah, 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 yeah. Can't but even see the river. It's reached as far as New York. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some it's of these, some of that stuff. It, it's scary, it's scary. But anyway, I mean, we got to keep on going. So right. <laughs> all right. So this is uh, the second part of my reading. Uh, item three, the real, the real political reform example, an example part two, uh, uh, date released, or same as previous. So next is presented the infamous document itself known as Plans for a Shadow Government, Prelude, and drawn up jointly by the three who called themselves Lycurgus, Solon, and Cleisthenes. We advocate a return to the Greek city-state, as yet undecided between Sparta and Athens with influence from Corinth, definitely minor. The Neo-Spartans among us favor a curtailment of decadence and the destruction of all nightclubs, bars, taverns, and other locales of debauchery, which they feel is where the current evil festered. Perhaps to be converted into gymnasia for the improvement of body and soul, or barracks. The entire country is to be placed on a strict diet until such time is deemed sufficient to reduce bloated bellies and sharpen dull minds. No extravagance of dress or behavior shall be tolerated either in private or in public, under pain of death. The Pan-Athenians, mindful of human frailty and temptation, ask only a labeling of prostitutes according to their talents and abilities. Also, they want a demerit system for people who live beyond their means, who frequent nightclubs, bars, taverns, and such like places too often, and who dance instead of concerning themselves with intellectual argumentation. The Panathenians have the upper hand at the moment, but the final decision will rest on the people. We advocate a war tribunal with all-encompassing powers to come into effect immediately upon the cessation of hostilities, regardless of victory or defeat. Information has been leaked that the enemy is planning just such a tribunal as a display of international justice. To show them the extent of our good faith, we should beat them to the punch by trying our own leaders and generals, both for war crimes and for tactical errors, with punishment as escalating as errors shade into crimes. The present caretakers of this nation have much for which to answer, and we intend to see that they do. As well, we seek the immediate disbanding of the collection agency, that perfidious society of psychotics whose only purpose is to harass innocent citizens. We have accumulated file upon file on this agency. Neither secret police nor palace guard has acted so cruelly and barbarously towards its own people. Once the agency has been disbanded, its agents are to be interrogated and integrated into the new military. A total reconciliation with the church is also deemed advisable, particularly by the Neo-Spartans. Already, several of the country's archbishops have been discreetly approached. We have the Vatican's tacit approval for our plans in return for certain favors, including state funds for rebuilding and restructuring. After all is said and done, it has been found that religion is still the easiest and most affordable way to draw people together before and following a war. As long as the members of the first estate are aware of where the power actually lies. As to the economy and the serious matter of inflation, we propose the immediate sale at the highest bid of our top scientists to foreign powers with an abundance of wealth but a paucity of technolog technological know-how. These scientists have worked feverishly and unquestionably for us through the war, making us the leaders in armaments, advanced battle techniques, and human experimentation and eugenics. 
they would be only too pleased to do the same for any nation that adopts them and pays them handsomely. <coughs> the Americans, in particular, have expressed interest in our rocket development program, chemical warfare discoveries, and atom bomb research. They have the metal, grain, wood, steel, and money to meet our requests. Negotiations are going on even now to have the leading researchers in, this, in those fields trans transferred to Arizona, a canton in the American desert. Of course, this will only be temporary and all shipments will halt the moment our secondary industries get back on their feet. Solon also points out that a precedent was set in the last war whereby a defeated nation could ask for and obtain foreign aid from the victorious. We have no intention of being defeated but unnatural events have occurred before and we must keep all avenues open. Cleisthenes has spent the last six months setting up the method whereby our provisional entente will be out of the shadows, will move out of the shadows. On July 20th, the present government leaders will be assassinated, leaving the country in a state of utter and complete turmoil. Thanks to the rapport between Cleisthenes and the present leader, these assassinations have the advantage of being conducted from the inside. The operatives have already been given orders to spare no one who holds the rank or has ever held the rank of minister. This is done purely for practical reasons to prevent the possibility of the government's revival. At the same time, all generals hostile to our plan or who display any hesitation before joining us will meet the same fate. A trained assassin operates within the personal staff of every general and minister. One month has been allowed for this, a month during which our people will get a further taste of chaos and the world will rub its hands furiously, but only for a moment. On August 20th, Pericles is scheduled to make his first appearance since being banished to command the Western Wall. He is riding across the occupied territories in an open tank. His presence in the streets of the capital will undoubtedly serve to calm the people and make them realize the leader, a veritable savior, is at hand. His magnetic personality requires neither fanfare nor forced demonstration. However, just in case they are needed, Lycurgus will parachute a selected portion of his troops into the city, effectively surrounding it. Temporary headquarters for the new government will be the recently vacated collection agency building, a touch of poetic justice. On August 29th, Pericles is to make an appearance on the balcony wearing the new uniform, which, is a, which in modified forms will be adopted by all state functionaries. Basic white Greek motif with flashes of red across the neck and stomach. The red is for hard lessons learned in the last 2,500 years. Immense celebrations have been prepared for that day and for the following octave. Pericles will walk among the people and allow them to touch him, revealing at the same time both legend and humanity. Solon declared himself against this on the grounds that many of the former leaders, Myrmidons, might still be about. We are putting our faith in Pericles' charisma, along with the fact that at the end of this walk, he will put to the torch all the records of the collection agency. It will be as if that uh, abomination will never have existed, will have been obliterated off the face of the earth. The most important and immediate effect of these letters and papers has been an increase in the powers of the collection agency. Most people, those with a clear conscience and a debt-free history, would be glad to know guns have been issued to the first-class agents who, are not, who are, now will have all the right to search homes without a warrant. Several agents, fearful of, those, of these very powers, have retired or been demoted. One of them was Claudius, who's, who, given an, an honorable discharge for performance of duties beyond the call, decided to join the Society of Jesus for a second time or perhaps a third if one counts that fortuitous first time. He even visited Père Alamand, the seminary being quite close, and was greeted with open arms as an old friend. As well, extraordinary agents have been assigned to uncover the instigators of the plot. Some are scouring the Ardennes forest, but so far the only discovery being a bas-relief sculpture brought back to agency headquarters as a keepsake. Others have infiltrated the wall as soldiers and military police. The arrest of, uh, the, the arrest of Cleisthenes, most recently identified as the propaganda minister, is imminent. By now, the rest of the traitors realize the letters and plans have been intercepted. We must act quickly before all evidence is destroyed. The dragnet closes in. Two clues are permanent. The first is that, although it was mandatory once to learn some forms of ancient Greek 
at the military academy. Not many officers could write it, and definitely not that known as Linear B. Thus, agents are presently examining the books and papers left behind at the academy by the officer cadets. The second clue is that we have discovered in a post office in Caen a personal copy of Schiller's Complete. Nothing in it gives away the sender's identity, but we are placing our faith in the poetic lady's love for Schiller. Sooner or later, in her desire to have her blood drained again and to feel the swoon of love palely loitering, she will claim it. All right. <laughs> That's the end of that, that uh, item in the collection agency files. Um, what are your future plans? What do you have going, coming up? Future plans. <laughs> Does anyone have a future? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Even virtual. <clears throat> um, I'm going to just keep working on my novel. Um, I am still at the first draft stage. It's, you know, turning out to be more complex than I thought it was to write a novel. So you know all about that. With your 200,000 words, you've been <laughs> down this rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, yeah, nobody really prepares you for how much work it is. <laughs> no. um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I just, I don't think I, I don't think, I don't think I understood how much trial and error there would be. I have a lot of direction I find with other projects. I sort of like focus in on something and I just chase it down. But with this, I've just, I've been all over town, down every rabbit hole. And now I think I know what I want to happen, but it's, it's like, there's like a two year throwaway period before you get to the real novel, it seems like. So. Yeah. Yeah. It took me 25 years to, for, for that novel, but, uh, but that's a little, a little out there, but uh, yeah, no, I, I know. And, and sometimes even setting up, you know, there are people who do, who do uh, uh, spreadsheets mm -hmm. for, for their novels. Right. And they, you know, and they actually have, they're, they actually to, uh, connect those, those, uh, the, the plots and the characters and all of that. Uh, and then you end up, throwing all that away and starting over again. It's <laughs> I wish I could show you. I'm actually, I'm at my um, work office, um, mm -hmm. but at home I've got this big poster board where okay. it's just like the novel takes place over 16 years. So I just have like these sort of two year increments and just trying to map like what's going on every two years. Right. And I just have all these questions. I'm like, does this person know this person? <laughs> Is this person going to die? Like, I don't, I just don't know. There's a, there's a child and I haven't decided whether or not he dies in a car accident. And it's a really big deal because it's going to have res. It's going to shape the novel either way. Like I need to figure out if this kid dies or not, but for some reason I'm just stuck on the fence. I'm like, yeah, like it'd be cool if he lives, but if he dies, it's easier, but I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then that's, you know, I, like I said, I, uh, part of my, in my in my in my bio, I, de I describe some of my writing as as metafictional, mm -hmm. um, and part of that it would be exactly the kinds of questions you're just asking, yeah. but you actually ask them in the novel. Oh yeah, that's cool. Maybe so, I maybe that's what I need to do. <laughs> so you say, should, should I kill this character off? You know, and uh, what will happen if I kill kill that character off? But we're right in the novel, right in the right in the novel itself. Well, dear reader, you know, what what do you think? You know, it's that, kind of cool. It's like breaking down the fourth wall in theater, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, like that idea. Well, well the, the the original uh, was uh, you know in, in English lit. Uh, this goes back to like to some of the first first novels, right? Uh, uh, Richardson, I think, was one of the writers. That, you know that they actually turned directly to the to the reader and and, and spoke to the reader mm -hmm. within the novel. You know, within within the novel, those were the, some of the original. Uh, writers who were metafictional writers. They didn't know they were metafictional writers. They weren't called metafictional writers, but they approached the, uh, the, the, that in, in that way, to speaking to, to, the, to the audience. Oh, and that probably has a lot to do just with the foundations of theater as one of the oldest literary forms, right? Like being the novel being born out of that, it probably exactly. took a while to transition and realize that in a novel, you don't have to speak to anyone. You can just tell the story. So. Yeah, but but I mean, you know, the the, the fact that you can speak uh, adds a, adds a layer to the to, to the novel. Adds a uh, you know an envelope. You develop you, you create a, a, a kind of a, an envelope around the writing, and you let the reader you let the reader know that yes, this is a novel. This mm -hmm. is not real life. This is mm -hmm. a creation that, that and maybe it's connected to real life, but maybe not. You mm -hmm. know, it comes from my head. You know, this is this is. Uh, 
it's an interesting approach and you know i i do it more and more these days because uh, uh, anyway so let's talk a bit about uh, your your life your writing during the covid period has has have you changed your routine at all during this uh, during this uh, period uh, i've been writing more um well i mean sort of i there was when it first happened i lost my child care which meant that i didn't write at all for 3 months but Child care is back. Um, everyone's working from home, so I have a lot less travel time. I live rurally, so I spent a lot of time in the car just getting to the college. And so now I, I find that I'm, I'm gaining bits of time that I didn't used to have. So I'm trying to write more. I, I feel this new sense of urgency just because I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what the publishing industry is going to look like. I don't know how readership will change as things continue to shift. And right. so... Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of put a fire under my ass, which is nice because I have had periods of years where I just become very comfortable with my day to day and don't write. You know, I'm one of those writers. I took a two year break when I first started teaching because um, I don't know. I just I found so much joy in teaching that I just didn't make time for writing. But it it built it was building up. I could feel like that mm -hmm. subliminal part of me just like it's getting rattling and hey, excuse me, <laughs> like let me hello. out. Let me out. <laughs> Feed me. I'm hungry. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it's 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 a pretty good scene right now. I've been writing differently as well. When I was in grad school, I used to write for very long periods of time. Um, I would write for 12 hours a day for four mm -hmm. days on, and then take four to seven days off, and that was my schedule, and it worked really well for me. And when I mean 12 hours, I mean somebody would deliver a sandwich and leave it outside the door. <laughs> like I wouldn't leave the room. Um, because I felt like I would lose something essential if I moved a muscle. Um, I can't do that anymore because I have other responsibilities like a family, but I did some experiments this summer where I went camping by myself and I always chose parks that didn't have internet and they didn't have phone so that I couldn't be tempted to waste time like a lot of us writers do when we're procrastinating. So um, I felt like physically removing myself from all distractions and like making it not possible. Um, to screw around on the internet was really helpful. And I, I ended up getting a lot of work done and rediscovered that joy of really truly being inside a piece of work the way that I used to. So I've discovered, yeah, I'm discovering new ways of making the writing life work for me. And that feels really good. Great. I mean, you know, a lot of writers are complaining that they thought that they were going to get, they were going to have a lot of time during this, uh, during this uh, uh, the COVID. And then they discovered that they got, they, got hit with writer's block. They were, yeah. Do you have any advice for, for uh, writers who might be hit that way in, during, during, uh, during, this, uh, during the COVID uh, break? Yeah, I mean, it's, as someone who's had writer's block and listened to other people's advice, I'm not sure that there is an outside cure for that. I think that people just sort of need to find their own way into it. But I would, I would definitely just let people know that physically removing myself from my usual location, being with na being in nature. I mean, this is like the old Thoreau thing. I mean, I'm just doing what he did hundred and some odd years ago. Um, but that really worked. It really works for me. Um, and also doing stuff like this, taking on an art slam or something where there's some sort of external pressure um, right. that can help get the fire going as well. So yeah, I okay. guess that, I guess that is some advice. Like a deadline of some kind. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but but like one that you actually have to be accountable for. If you just set a deadline, like, oh, I'm going to submit to this magazine. Oh. The magazine yeah. doesn't, and not, they're not waiting for anything from you. Exactly. Yeah. But something like an art slam where it's like you're participating and then somebody wants to actually see evidence that you did something at the end of it. Something like that, I think, is a little bit different and there's more accountability. So just mm. figuring out ways to, to create accountability, however that can happen, I think can be helpful. All right, so we'll, we're going to end with uh, your third reading, which is okay. your flash fiction, uh, Eye for an Eye. Wow. Well, okay. Yeah. I will do that now. So this is an example of like, I would never write something like this if the pandemic hadn't happened. It was really directly a product of that. And um, yeah, I was just in that 
very short story, I was just trying to think about how for some people the pandemic created a stronger sense of community and for others it just ended up fragmenting and for others it's just sort of like recontextualized how they fit into their environment. So um, yeah, I was trying to just look at all those different things within the 500 words and I found it difficult. I'm a long form writer so <laughs> I tried to make it fit. <laughs> Anyways, this is called Eye for an Eye. <clears throat> When the pandemic starts and schools close, my father loses his job fracking and the housekeeper Lucille quits when he smacks her ass with a curling trophy. It's decided that I should go live with my uncle wizard for a while. The wizard meets us halfway near Frank Slide on the BC Alberta border. An aura of tea tree oil floats around him. After an awkward goodbye, my father vanishes, his soon to be sold Hummer blending with the decimated landscape. I climb into the wizard's rusted Tacoma with his mutt strawberry fields and we head west, the wizard smoking hand rolled cigarettes as we drive while he educates me about prepping, about EMP attacks and aquaponics. All I can think about is COVID, defunding the police, my lack of friends, and how much I hate tea tree oil. Half a day later, we're in the Slocan Valley down a long driveway lined with dense foliage. The trees resemble the wizard, skinny and weird with branches akin to his overgrown mustache. I settle into the rarely used guest room between large tanks of darting fish to be moved outside when the weather warms. That night, I dream that I'm a tilapia, silver and sharp toothed, trapped. The next morning, we drive up a logging road, strawberry fields, white paws draped in my lap. We take trees from slash piles and saw them up for firewood and barter. The wizard points out plants and animal scat. Baneberry, he says, pointing to a luscious red bush. I reach for it. He swats and says, sometimes pretty things will kill you. All spring, we busy ourselves with the daily work of survival. Summer comes late, so we spend rain-soaked nights playing old world games like chess and canasta. Sometimes I watch protest videos at the Slocan Library and I miss the city, but mostly I walk through the forest, spellbound by fresh sap, content to be buffered from the slowly unraveling world. Under the wizard's tutelage, I learn patterns, plants, strategies. I feel smart. Once outside, the tilapia zip after our shadows while we toss them pellets and corn, they grow fat, my father doesn't send for me. Every night when the sun sinks behind the Valhalla Mountains, it leaves a blue orb of light. And for a moment, I see an ephemeral, otherworldly flash of hope. My father finally calls in September. No, I say to the wizard, blocking the phone. It rings and it rings. Two weeks pass and suddenly my father appears outside with a rifle. Strawberry Fields barks, he shoots. As she limps across the grass, dragging a blood-soaked paw, we hurl things at my father, bottles, empty pots, a hubcap. Strawberry Fields licks her wound under the Tacoma, and I say, let's just shoot my father in the foot, show him how it feels. The wizard gives me a look and says, Deanna, don't you know? An eye for an eye will make the whole world blind. Still, we know that I'll have to leave with my father, so he lets me rage until the last bottle has been smashed. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, I love the the combination of the there's a wild kind of wild surrealism that gets the whole thing going, and and then kind of a then the family the family grounding part as well is kind of a that's a really strange combination. Uh, yeah. Weird story for sure. <laughs> oh, I, I hope you uh, you're offering this, uh, this this flash fiction for our. Uh, uh, this will only take a minute. Uh, I am uh, yes, yes. It is yours if you want it. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So anyway, this marks uh, this marks the end of uh, episode four of uh, our sixfold uh, exercise in uh, literary w wisdom. I want to thank uh, thank uh, Lisa for 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 patience and and and. Uh, for, for coming out uh, this, this time around. And uh, be sure to be here for episode uh, uh, five, where I'll be reading from uh, collection, uh, the further part of collection agency files. And I'll have 
another special, special guest. So thanks again. And, uh, Thank you for having me. Good luck with all, with all your future plans. And uh, hopefully next time I'm out in, uh, in uh, British Columbia, uh, we can meet non-virtually and have a cup of coffee or something. You're always welcome at my home. All right. Thank you. Thank you again. All right. Take care. All right. Thank you. You too.